Now, Father, I pray you'll bless our time together tonight and uh, open our hearts. Thank you for these people that have chosen to come this evening. And I pray that we'll be rewarded for our diligence. <clears throat> and thank you for the opportunity to meet in freedom in a free country. And uh, thank you for the people that paid for that this weekend for sure as we memorialize those who gave the full measure for our freedom. Pray that you'll bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're talking tonight about Saul, the very first king of Israel. Israel didn't have a king before this. They were uh, a theocracy. Theocracy means rule by God. So they had a prophet or a priest that would tell them what God was doing and what God was saying to them. And the priest would then tell the people and uh, they got along just fine. But they weren't like all other nations because other nations had a king. And uh, they, uh, they uh, were challenged in this day to just trust God. And, and if you trust God, you won't need a king. You won't need an army. You got God. What else is there? And so the people whined about that and complained about that, as people do. Uh, and they said, we want a king. We want to be like uh, other nations. And we want a, a God to give us a, a king. And uh, God uh, told Samuel, the prophet, you know, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And so don't take this personal. And uh, we're going to work it out so that we're going to give them a king. Now, this is an interesting scenario here because God is creating a, uh, something that I'm going to call his, his uh, acceptable will. Not his perfect will. His perfect will was to be the theocracy. But his acceptable will was, I'm going to help you choose a king. So... I think we, know, we should know the difference between the perfect will of God in our lives and the acceptable will of God in our lives. And so they went out and uh, God said, I want you to find a guy. And uh, they went out and ended up finding Saul. Now Saul was a big guy. He was uh, head and shoulders over everybody, the Bible says. He was uh, the quarterback of the football team and voted most likely to succeed at, in high school. And uh, so they said, you're going to be the king. And he said, you know, I don't know nothing about being king. Uh, I, I, I didn't do so good in king class. And, and I kind of flunked that one. And then, no, 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 don't worry about it. God's going to give you a new heart. And you're going to be turned into a new man. Wouldn't that be cool? Oh, yeah. well, Wouldn't that be cool if God gave you a new heart and you were turned into a new man? Wouldn't that be cool? Well, I, I, I'm here to tell you that happens every day somewhere in the world now. God gives people a new heart, and he turns them into a new man, turns them into new people. So Saul was anointed king, and here he is now, and he went out among the people. And uh, it says that after the day was over that he went home to his own place. And... Um, <clears throat> Verse 25 of the same chapter, and Samuel took the people, told the people the manner of the kingdom, and wrote it in a book. So here's how you do the king stuff. And laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel went, or sent all the people away, every man to his own house. Now listen to this. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. <coughs> What a cool notion. Here's a whole band of men that God has touched their hearts and uh, turned them into new people. How cool is that? And I'm here to tell you that happens everywhere now, everywhere. Uh, I spend a good, bit, a good bit of time over in uh, North Africa. Oh, man, God's touching hearts over there like crazy and turning people into new people. He's helping them to get rid of their religious lunacy and embrace him and uh, turning them into new people altogether. I know personally, I know two 
terrorists who are no longer terrorists and uh, because God touched their hearts. I know an imam who used to be a, that's a Muslim pastor, and God has touched his heart, and he's no longer an imam. They fired him when he started t talking about Jesus. They went, well, you can't be the imam, you know, you're done here. And uh, God does that all over the world. Uh, I think God wants to do that in, in Salvation Army. And you know, you can, you can, I think you can just thank God that he's given you a chance like this. How many guys are not here that are out there somewhere living in a doorway or in a, under a tree or in a, uh, more and more and more are getting like that. What a blessing it is to be sitting in a place like this where if you're open to it, God will give you a new heart. Now, it says God touched these men's heart. Now, I don't know what that did for them. And I don't know how it changed them. But I do know how it changed me. And so I'm going to talk to you about that. Because uh, when I accepted the Lord, something happened inside here. And it took me places that I never would have dreamed. And, and it gave me perspectives that I never would have had. And, and, uh, and it took me out of the mindset of... I want to get all I can and can all I get into, I'm, now I just feel like I can't give enough. And uh, well, that's just not natural, is it? No, it's not. It's actually supernatural. It's not part of the human condition. It doesn't flow naturally from us that we would be giving sort of people instead of taking sort of people. How, what did happen when God gives you a new heart? And uh, here's one thing that happened to me was, and it took me a while to get to this, and I'm going to go over to Second Peter chapter number 1, and here's what it did there. <laughs> here's what Peter says to us, and uh, you might want to look there, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. He said, beside this, giving all diligence... And, if you, and by the way, if you're giving something diligence, what does that mean you're doing? Focusing intently. Say it again. Focusing intently. I think so. You're, you're really after this thing. You're going to give it all you got, right? Yeah. Okay, we're going to give it all. And so here's what it says. Giving all diligence. Here's what I want you to do, said Peter. Add to your faith. And that's where mine started. It was an act of faith, a step of faith. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I didn't know what was going to happen. But it, it says, I want you to add to your faith. And then he gives a list of things that we are supposed to add. This isn't stuff that God does. This is stuff that we do. It says, I want you to add to your faith virtue. And virtue is, of course, moral character. And uh, so it said, here's what I want you to do. If you're going to follow this path, I want you to add to your faith. And by the way, when a person accepts Jesus as his Savior, all he basically has at that moment is a fire escape. Right? It's going it's to keep you out of hell. But, but what you didn't count on was it's going to change your mind about things as we go down the path. So if you do this, here's what it says, add to your faith virtue. That's moral character. And I want you to add to virtue knowledge. And once we add knowledge, and by the way, where do we get knowledge? Well, this is the best knowledge we can find. And here's what I'm saying. This is stuff you didn't have before. Otherwise, you might not be in the mess you're in. <coughs> you know? So you add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, I want you to add knowledge. And knowledge to me is how the way it really works, not how we figured it should work. And the way you figured it should work doesn't work very well, generally, until we add some good knowledge to it. So I want you to add to your faith virtue, that's moral character. Then I want you to add knowledge. And then it goes on to say, and I want you to add to knowledge, temperance. You know what temperance is? Self-control. Self oh my gosh. If I only had some more of that, right? <laughs> this would keep me out of trouble. Self-control, and that means I'm going to be control of myself. I'm not going to let myself be in control of me. I'm not going to let my body tell me what to do. I'm going to tell my body what to do. I'm going to tell my body when to go to bed. I'm going to tell my body when to get up. 
I'm going to tell my body what to eat. I'm, not, I'm going to tell my body what not to smoke. And I'm going to tell my body what not to take. I'm, I'm just not going to go there. And I'm going to drink certain things, but I'm going to be careful what I put into my body because I'm the boss of my body. And I'm not going to let it rule me. That's temperance. Add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance. Then what are we going to add to temperance? <sighs> Patience. Oh, my gosh. Who's got that, right? And uh, things take time. Have you figured that out? You, you can't just push a button. Don't you wish you could? Just push the... You take the drunk button and you push the undrunk button and wow... I made it, right? You took the drug addict, but no, no, I don't want, I want you, I just want to push this. It doesn't work that fast. Wouldn't it be nice? You got to add temperance and you got to be in control of yourself and, and you got to learn this. It's a process. And I guess one day at a time, right? And then after a while, it's a week. And then after a while, it's a month. <laughs> And it takes patience to get there. And here's what we add to patience. Are you ready? Godliness. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means God-likeness. So the question is, what's God like? If you're going to add God-likeness, then what's God like? Well, he's not afraid of God, for one thing. <laughs> not trying to dodge spiritual things. Not trying to... Uh, and by the way... If I, had to, if I had to put a word over God, what would it be? One big word that sort of covers it all. Love. I think that's it. I think that's it. I think love runs the universe. And that's why, for God so loved the world, what, what did he do? Well, what kind of love is that, man? More than we generally have, would you say? All right, so that's being God-like. So you add this to yourself and you end up like God and uh, I think that's God's plan for us you say well I didn't come here for that I just came here to push the sober button no no you can't get there from here you got to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and knowledge patience and temperance and self-control then it says brotherly kindness so uh, guess what? Here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm taking care of me, and then I take care of my relationship with God, and now I'm going to invest myself in somebody else. Brotherly kindness. And I, I think that's a bit of accountability anyway. I think when you say to someone, I'm going to help you, let's take this road together, I think there's a little accountability there. I think it kind of helps you. It makes your journey easier. Because you're invested in somebody else that will keep you honest, right? So we add to it brotherly kindness. And, uh, and to brotherly kindness, guess what we add? Now we have love. Charity. But listen to verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What if these things are not in you? then as far as God's concerned, you're barren and unfruitful. And you know what unfruitful is? It, it, your life just doesn't count for much. William, William Whitman and J.W. William Whitman and J.W., please report to the Rec Room for Spade. Thank you. See you, William. Yeah. Go out there and slap that guy, will you? See yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> in a brotherly kindness way. Yes. It, do it in love, though. Yes. <laughs> If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. Now, let me tell you what fruitful is to me. Fruitful is you live a life that leaves a legacy of some sort. I mean, it doesn't have to stop the world, but it has to be something, for crying out loud, that says, I was here. And uh, remember the, the, the Shawshank Redemption, where what did the guy get up there and he, he carved his name up there and said he was here. What was his name? Brooks was here. That's it. Yeah. 
Wouldn't it be nice if you left something behind that mattered? And that's being fruitful. I've got a brother that is uh, uh, alcoholic. And uh, <clears throat> his daughter is alcoholic. He's got a son that's hooked on drugs. And it's just a bad world. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 I would hate to say that's all I left behind. Now, so far, I've got a drug addict son, but he's on the right road, I hope. And uh, somebody say, how's he doing? I say, so far, so good. You know what that means? This guy jumped out of a 10 floor window. Remember this? And passing the third floor, somebody heard him say, so far, so good. <laughs> right. So, uh, fruitful. And I have decided in my own life, that matters to me. It matters. And if I don't leave behind family, I'm going to leave behind some guys that, I, I don't know, I'm just, I, I'm giving it my best. That's all I know. Got some guys overseas, and when I go there, they all hug me, and they want to kiss me. Oh, my gosh. And they did kiss you here, here, and there. And then they kiss twice over here. So they go three times, and, and you come back sick as a dog because you catch everything they got. You know, that's, that's just the way it works. My last at least five times over, I've gotten sick. And, but, you know, you, you pour into somebody else, and, and that bears fruit. That's cool. So I decided after sort of getting my head around it, it didn't happen the first day, but I accepted Jesus. And it took me a while, took me a while, took me a while to say, this is really the right way to go. It took me a while, but finally I said, that's it. I get it. I'm going. I'm all in. And, you know, they use the term all in. Well, I... And we say to ourselves, uh, uh, all in is a good way to be. But I thought, who, what did you say, call? call? I like that. I heard said that before, didn't I? <laughs> because all you're really doing, you're not going all in. You're not the first one. God's already done that. All you're doing is saying, I call. Because he's already been all in. Came here and suffered an unimaginable death. So, I decided... When, after God touched my heart, that I was going to do something diligent. I was going to be diligent. And what you said was, ah, that's it. I've been like that for, since 1973. Actually, 1970, I was starting to get my motor revved up. And by 1973, I was in the ministry. Uh, that's it, man. I'm going, I'm going to do this. You no, know, we don't all have to be in the ministry, no, but we all have to minister. We all have to do something, you know. It's not about you. Unfortunately, you may have a hard time learning that. But it's never been about you. It's always been about God and His ways. And you're, kind of, you're trying to figure out, why doesn't God answer my prayer? Because you're asking for yourself, man. Ask for Him to be glorified, and, and you're more likely to touch a nerve spiritually dwell with him John 15 ask what you will listen to this ask what you will he said if you abide in me and I abide in you then you can ask what you will and you'll get it so what does that mean that means that we're on the same page I know what he wants which decides what I want and I'm more likely to get what I ask for if I do that. And uh, you're very unlikely to get what you ask for if all you're going to do is use it for yourself. <clears throat> ask what you will. And I find that when I ask for things that have to do with ministry, they happen more likely than if I'm asking for new cars, and homes, and money, and in fact, <laughs> I never have been able to get much of that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can't even sell my stinking books. All right. <laughs> and by the way, I don't think that... I've been a minister since 1973, officially. 
That's a long time. I have never considered it a sacrifice. I've considered it a high honor. I get to do God's stuff. I get to do what he wants. What an honor. Isn't that crazy? I'm an ambassador. Ambassador Young, that's me. (laughs) I represent a land that's not even here, another home. And I love what it says in Hebrews 11 about those guys. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but they saw them afar off, and they were were persuaded of them, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That just blows my mind. How can a person get to that where they realize, I'm just passing through here? I don't want to be investing all my life in this and I got news for you anyway it's going to burn up you know the, the world's going to pass away the Bible says it's, going to, it's all going to burn up <coughs> sorry didn't mean to discourage you I think we can also draw courage and I think that in my own life I do that from time to time I, I remember going my first trip over to North Africa it's a little creepy you know I'm going right into the Muslim <laughs> world. I'm, I'm going into the Satan's den. And I didn't know that I was tense, but I was over there by myself. I went, I was in with this group of guys, great guys, awesome guys. But right outside the door were some guys that would gladly cut my head off. And uh, I didn't hang around them. You know, I'm just there for this one purpose. And, and, and I, I didn't know it, but I was all tensed up. And when I got back to the United States and I walked through passport control and the guy said, welcome home. I went, wow. All of a sudden I got emotional. I went, I didn't even know that was in me. I didn't know I felt that way. But I guess I was rather uptight and didn't even know it, you know. And you draw, I mean, why would you, somebody said, I I took a couple of guys over there with me, and and, uh, Andy Adcock, I had to talk him into it, you know, Andy, come on, let's go over, I want you to go, we're going to teach together, man, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, you're going to have fun. He said, you know, my my family's saying it a little dangerous. I said, oh man, Andy, listen to me, what a way to go. I mean, if you make a mark in your death instead of what what I say last week, dying of prostate cancer in some nursing home somewhere, how exciting is that, right? You're going to die. Might as well do something cool with it if you... Now, I'm not thinking out loud, Lord. I'm just just, uh, making a sermon here, making a point. I'm not praying here. Yeah, I know, right? <clears throat> the touch that God gave me made me depart. Remember what God said to Abraham? I want you to go to the land I'm going to show you. And Abraham said, well, where is it? And he said, well, you'll know when you get there. So Abraham went home and told his wife, we're going to another land. And she said, where are we going? He said, I don't know. Well, will we know when we get there? You'll, you'll know. Mm-hmm. How? I don't know. Just pack the U-Haul, we're going. And so they got, and here off they went, man. You know, every time I go overseas, I, I just got back from Cuba a few months ago, and it's kind of a, a, a oppressed place. And uh, what are we doing here? I don't know, but I just, it makes me depart. It makes me go where I'm not comfortable. And I really think that that's, a good place to be, right outside of your comfort zone. Right outside of where you think you, yeah, it doesn't make me, no, I'm not worried about comfort. I heard that the cross was uncomfortable. You know? I don't think God wants us comfortable. I think he always wants us stretching just a little bit. Maybe that's why you're here. Stretch just a little bit. Come on, let's, What's the next step? What's the next place? Where am I going from here? 
And that's what happened to me. And uh, some of you guys just need to depart from the old life and leave it behind, man. Go somewhere new. And by the way, you might not physically be anywhere. Remember that uh, the guy, the prodigal son went into a far country? Remember that story? He went into a far country. You know where the far country is? I think it's between your ears. I think you can go into a far country just sitting here. You can be off somewhere. Who knows where you are right now, right? You can be wishing for this or that or the other. I think that's what God will make you do. If you get your heart touched just right, make you leave stuff. Leave stuff behind. It'll also make you die. And I don't mean necessarily physically, I mean spiritually. You die to yourself. My self ambitions, my aspirations. Somebody tried to get me to set some goals. I was pastoring a church in Michigan years ago. I had a deacon. His name was Clifford McReynolds. And I said, man, he said, I want you, why don't you set some goals? Where do you want to be in five years? I said, I don't know how do you do that. If I did that, I'm going to inject my own thinking into it, my own feelings. I just want to be where God wants me to be in five years, wherever that is. And the next door opens, I want to go through it. I don't know what it looks like. We just started this thing called Vocational Church. This is insane. What in the world are we thinking? Got a bunch of drug addicts living in my house. How does that work, right? I've lost my mind. But I feel good about it. I feel good about it. I feel like I'm doing something. You know what I'm saying? Got Gary in here. He said, man, I was, I was willing to pull the plug, man. I, I was in an awful place in my life. Jeff here said, I was, I was in a mess, man. I was without hope. Now, what a nice, you get to lay down at night and, and, and sleep in a place. Jeff's got a job, gets his first paycheck next week, I hope. Yeah, man. Yeah, how cool is that? That's because I said to myself, self, what difference does it make to you where God takes you? A door opens, you go through it. My, uh, my son started down the path of addiction. Who would want anything? I'm an optimist. I I see lemonade. No point in being sourpuss about things. God, my son gives me lemons. Let's make lemonade. Right? It's a door that opened. God opened the door. As far as I'm concerned, God opened it. I don't know what the next door is going to... Who in the world would ever go to the prison and see all these prisoners, murderers? And, and I just had a, a, an ex-con clean my car Thursday. Or was that Friday? He sits at, my, sits at my dining table on Thursday evening. We do a little Bible study. I, I, who, who would do such a thing? I think that's what... What would you say? I think that's where Jesus would be. Don't you? He'd be at the prison. He'd be right here. That's, I'm here because I think this is where he would be. But I have to die to my own aspirations to do that. I have to tell myself, it doesn't matter. You know, I remember going into the ministry, I used to think to myself, what are you going to do for money and what's going to happen to you? And, and you know, you would, all you ever wanted to do was be a success, but what is that? I don't even know. And, and I used to tell myself this, I just want to be able to eat out now and then. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, you got to give all that up and eat bologna sandwiches, right? 
Now I just wish I could get a home cooked meal. You know what I'm <laughs> 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 now I eat out all the time, I for, for crying out loud. We'll leave here and we'll go and buy these guys a patty melt and some fries. And, yeah, right. No, just just my guys. I I, I got my guys. I also know that as a result of God's touch on my life that it makes me want to do stuff. Not to prove myself, it just says you got to do something. You got to, not for crying out, do, do something worthwhile. And so that's how it affected me. I don't want to do nothing. I used to be a computer programmer. And I love the idea of just writing a computer program. You know what? I'm the guy that started the Y2K problem way back in the 60s. I said, whoever needs a four-digit year? We, we can get by with a two-digit year. Come on. It's a problem here. Back when we started writing all those COBOL programs back, they're still going as far as I know, but it doesn't matter to me anymore. I, 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 I tell myself I could probably still write one in my sleep. I could do that. I dream about doing things like that. I dream about getting out of the service, and I forgot to uh, pack. And it's the day I got out, and I forgot to pack. And I'm going, what? A, uh, this is nuts, man. But that's all history. I just want to do something. I want to... I want to accomplish something. I don't want to do stuff for me. I want to do stuff for God. It is, ex I haven't had a paycheck since 19, let me think. Uh, it's been a while. A real paycheck. But uh, how much fun it is, though, to see God supply needs. As opposed to getting that Friday paycheck. Now, now, that's nice. That's got its value, right? But just to see, God walked up to me today and handed me 500 bucks. He said, do whatever you want to with it. Went, wow, man, how cool is that? I'm going to buy these guys patty melts, right? <laughs> I might have one too. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of patty melts. I'll tell you something else it caused me to do. It caused me to depend on God. I'm dependent. Anybody in here dependent? I think God made us dependent. Do you know that? I think he wanted us to be dependent. You just have to be careful where you focus that. Who is that? Who is that masked man, right? <laughs> we, yeah, we're going to get him out of here, right? We're gonna... This is something else that happened to me. It made me determined to do my part to save the world. You can't even think about that, can you? That, that's a, what a thought that is. How do you do that? One person at a time. That's all I know. I remember years ago, I introduced my first person ever to Jesus. And it made me nervous. So I'm not sure I know how to do this, you know. And uh, I, I was very cautious. I've got to get this right. Got to, this is a person's destiny. I don't, I don't want... I, I, and I've since ramped it up. Now, instead of working with one person at a time, I work with 50 or 100 or several hundred. Or in the Middle East, I work with 50 guys that represent 500 million people and from five countries. That's multiplication there, isn't it? But I want to see the world saved. I don't know. I don't. 
I don't know that I get much credit for that, but at least it's on my mind. And I'll tell you this, I'm at the other end of my life right now, I'm 71, about to be 72. I mean, shouldn't you? Should. Jay Neal, James Harrison, Daniel Griffin, and Brian Mock, please support the stage. Also, I need Robin Rillard, Daniel B. Imperio, JJ, and John Hayes. Thank you. See y'all. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> Remember the Apostle Paul said at the end of his life, he was in jail, 2 Timothy 4. This was his swan song. He said this, he said this, the time of my departure is at hand. He said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I'm ready to be offered. I thought, what a cool thing to be able to say at the end of your life. I have finished my course. Jesus said that. He said that to the Father. I finished what you gave me to do. And here's Paul saying, I finished what you gave me to do. And I want to be able to say, I've, I, I, you know, I, I think I've done it all. I don't, if there's something else, I'll wait and see. But it's satisfying. It's satisfying. So here's what I'm saying. When God touches your heart, things happen. I mean, it, your perspective gets different. You know, your journey takes a turn for the better. Your focus gets different. And if you do what you're supposed to do and add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, all, all those things, you become a better person. Your life becomes more fruitful. You begin to bear fruit instead of to waste your life. It begins to matter. Uh, does that appeal to you? Yes. That your life actually matters for something? Yes. I got a kick out of Tim here. He's been, his, his ex-wife's been trying to talk with him. Tim's going, oh, no, I don't know. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know. I'm just... You know how those Mexicans are. He says. <laughs> but he said the other day, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to call her. I went, well, oh, that's cool. Huh? Well, you get a chance to influence somebody because she won't believe what the new Tim sounds like. She just remembers the old Tim. I like that. You know, you get, to, you get a chance to ratchet things up a bit and make a mark. Do something good instead of tear up people's lives. You get to build them up. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Does that appeal to you? It should. How many people's lives have you screwed up along your way? <coughs> yeah, see, you got to turn that around. you got to turn that around. Well, here's how we do that, Jeff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He was mocking me in the car. It sounded like mocking. I took it as mocking. <laughs> We've got to connect. We have to take that first step of faith like I did so many years ago. Actually, 60 years this month, June. 60 years ago in June, I opened my heart to Jesus. I was 12. That's a long time, isn't it? It's been a long journey. I asked myself, would I change it? What would I change? I, 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 I can't think of anything. I'd like to straighten out some of my failures, but even those have channeled me in a certain direction. You know, nothing like screwing up something to make it better, right? All of a sudden, things get a little bit better. You learn something from it. Part of your learning curve. So we're going to pray in a minute. And I would hope this, that for some of you here, you would open your heart to Jesus and say, I want my heart touched. 
I, I, I want to be different. I, I want something more than what I've had that makes sense in the big scheme of things. Not just me and my little problems, but how is this going to affect those around me? I want my life to count. So let's pray and talk to the Lord about that. What do you think? Let's bow our heads. And I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm going to change it up a little bit tonight. I want you to talk to God about this. I want you to say something like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. The best I know how. I accept Jesus as my Savior. I know I can't save myself. So I'm trusting Jesus to save me. I pray that you'll help me make my life count. Set me on a different path. Help me make a mark for good. In my life and the life of others. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus name. Only you and God knows if your heart was touched. I I can do this every week until I die. But it takes an open heart, open mind. And if you're not sure if that worked or not, I'd try it again tonight and tomorrow, day after that. You know, there's one of the prisoners at Zephyr Hills Prison. He was, he was nuts, man. I mean, he tried to kill himself. He went to jail. They gave him a life sentence. He started banging his head against the wall. He wanted himself dead. And they put him in a chair and strapped him in so he couldn't bang his head against the wall. And here's what happened. Something interesting. You never know, right? A guard came by and said to him, You need to talk to God. And left. He went, I don't need to talk to, well, I don't know, maybe I do. He said it turned, that, that, that phrase was the switch that turned his mind, turned his heart. Just like that, he said, I began talking to God. You know who this is? This is, uh, this is, um, this is, uh, exactly, I, I don't remember his name. Yeah, that's right, that's right. The guy that always closes in prayer. Don't give up on that. You need to talk to God. That's pretty good advice. Do it a lot. That's even better advice.